Salyan, I posted on our social feed, both on YouTube and on Instagram, a video from a couple of years ago where I ran my boat into an island. <laughs> and here's the worst part about it. I literally just picked it up from the marina after having getting one of the pontoons fixed because it was leaking. Oh, yeah, and, that's got to be just a low point right there. But the best part of the whole stinking thing, and it's for you right now, you get to you get to benefit from the stupidity that I have, <laughs> is that I've videoed the whole thing. Now, you may say, Russ, why were you videoing while you were driving a boat? That why was were the question you, I had, yes. Yeah, did you know you're about to do something stupid, and you're like, let's catch this thing, hold my beer? No. <laughs> well, here's what happened. I was, I was, we were coming back from the marina. My wife dropped me off on the way to the lake house, so... Ryan and I and the dog jump in a boat. We're, we're heading back. I see what seems to be an eagle on a little small island. And I think, oh, this is going to be so cool. Let's whip around and come back by the island in the front of it. I always drive by this island, but I always drive by on the sides. I was like, well, let's drive by the front of it. So, I, oh, man, I'm going to get this on, on video because Megan and the kids are going to see this eagle, right? They're going to see this stuff. And so I'm like videoing it. And there's Ryan at the very beginning of the boat. And all of a sudden he starts, the, the eagle flies off the tree, or actually I think it may have been an osprey. I don't even think it was an eagle. But whatever it was, he flies out in front of us. The, the, the dog jumps up. And all of a sudden uh, Ryan starts going, rocks, rocks. Well, I, I was not listening to him, Joey. You're still focused on the eagle. I'm focused on the eagle, and all of a sudden within seconds it's like, boom. <laughs> the oh. boat runs up. R- runs up on the rocks and Ryan's so funny in the, in the video. He's like, run aground. <laughs> and all of a sudden the, the camera goes down, you know, it's just chaos dogs running up and down the boat. And he's like, I told you there was rocks. <laughs> and I was like, you did. He's like, yeah, I said rocks. <laughs> so You just no, weren't, you weren't listening or what? No, I, I was not listening. And I want to I'm gonna tie today's podcast into this, right? So we're we're covering what are the benefits becoming the bank in this podcast on the round table. But I want to tie in there's a couple of things here. And underneath the surface right now, what are the rocks for people, Joey? Oh, you mean the the potential hazards? Uh yeah. I would say it is the way they're managing their money, right? The way they are on a razor thin margin. Um, they're, they're spending more than they make They're They could potentially lose their job in the midst of this recession. Yeah. I, and there were many more things, but those are t- typically time. maybe just one bad deal from, from being in a really bad position. That That's what's just lying right underneath the water. Just like those rocks were for that Island. It were right underneath the water. I couldn't see them because what was I watching? Right. I, I was looking at the ego. I was looking at the beauty. I was, yeah. I, I, I was not focused. And that, think about that for others. What What are some of the things that people are focused on right now, where they're not really trying to see this? I I think most people are looking at other people right now. Social media. Mm. What are What are other people doing to get ahead? What are other people doing to to have the this vacation or, you know, this daily grind, this this hustle, whatever. They're focused on all the external things that are going on, but not looking at the rocks. Yeah. Well, there. Hey, how many of you have stopped learning, right? How many of your friends have stopped learning? You went to college, you invested in yourself to to get an education so you can create this job or the career that you're in, but yet have stopped learning, have stopped investing in yourself to become financially free. And, and I know that's uh, that's not you, right? You're listening to this podcast. You're like, what are you saying? I, I'm investing in myself. But we right. all find ourselves from time to time looking at the eagle and not looking for the rocks. And he, here, just like Ryan on the front of the boat, I want to ask you, who is pointing out the rocks to you? Who do you have who's looking for those things? Who Who's in your corner trying to help you avoid running aground? That's the Wealth Without Wall Street team. That's why we have this roundtable, right? We are here with the beacon of light trying to shine it and say, pay attention, passive income, cash flow, financial freedom. Like those are the things that are going to help you stay afloat uh, amidst the troubled waters that we're facing. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, another thing right underneath the current as we get ready to go into the podcast. One thing underneath there too is many of us have young kids at home and they're growing so fast. 
and we're we're focused on all those things that you talked about a second ago just living the living the life right just yep. just trying to keep up i mean a lot of times we feel like we're underwater right we got so many things but the kids are re- the kids leaving the house is right underneath the water for us that it is so close if you've watched the instagram post i actually talk a little bit about that toward the end about how we get so focused on work and how we allow the kids to grow up and they're out of the house boom they're gone and it doesn't have to be that way, right? There are people at, there's Ernie, there's Mark, there's JD, who are pointing out the rocks and saying, hey, here's how you can avoid them. Here's how you can avoid your kids growing up and you watching them out the door and you hadn't really spent time with them. So today's podcast is just one of those points that helps tie those things together, helps you understand the benefits of being in the bank so that you can take action on the path. So Joey, let's pull up to the table and belly up. Belly up. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome into the Financial Freedom Roundtable, where each week we break down complex financial topics so that you can more easily understand them and more importantly, take action on your path to becoming financially free. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Grateful to have you in the room. I'm Russ Morgan. They call me the idea guy, mostly because lack of follow through guy just didn't sound so cool to me. But enough about me for the moment. Let me introduce to you my co-host, my partner, the Italian Stallion. He's got the license plate cover to prove it. Mr. Joey Murray. Stallion, good afternoon. Yes, sir. Glad to be here, Russ. Uh, man, this is this is the kind of topic that gets you fired up. It's a sleeper topic. You know what I'm talking about? Well, what is the topic first, Stallion? Well, what are the benefits of being the bank? That's our that's our our title for the week. And I think it's a sleeper topic because I don't think people fully understand when we start talking about being a bank, it's kind of like this, this ambiguous idea that's out here that they don't really know or think applies to them until we get to the the nuts and bolts of today's topic. And then it's going to be like, oh, snap, I need to pay attention. So you've used the word sleeper two times in a row. Either you're on like a Keith or Sutherland kick right now, or you've been watching the WWE. Where'd that term come from? And you're just dropping that on us. Well, think about that. Like a sleeper is that that person or that topic or whatever it is that just kind of comes up behind you and catches you off guard. Like you don't know it's coming until it's there. I mean, don't you don't you see what I'm talking about? Oh my goodness. No. You ever been at a I party don't. and you're like, you know, just kind of going around and meeting people and you're like, that that guy that's over there on the corner, you, you don't you're like, I'm not gonna worry about meeting him. He's he seems right. like a goob. And you go and meet him and he's like the coolest guy in the room. That's a sleeper. That's what that's what you call a sleeper. Uh, I don't think that that's what anybody else calls a sleeper, but it's good that that's what you that you go with. I'm gonna phone a friend in here. I'm gonna get somebody else into this conversation. Who's going to hopefully uh, bail you out? Because that was that was pretty brutal. Russ, we people got... have mentioned you being a sleeper all the time to me. They're like, <laughs> yeah, I never would have thought that guy was as cool as he is. No, I, I am a sleeper. My sister said I had African sleeping sickness as a kid, man. Like I was constantly <laughs> sleeping. Like, I, yes, I love sleep. I, I'm the first one to go to bed at night anywhere I am. Like I can go to sleep right here talking to you guys. Just give me 30 seconds. I promise you, I have no issue sleeping, but I don't think that's what we're talking about. I am sick and tired of talking about this with you. I want to get across, across the way to the true financial Sherlock Holmes of our day. No problem too difficult to solve. If I would have just only known you earlier, brother, I've been so much richer says everybody, Mr. Downtown Ernie Brown. I see Ern. Nice to be seen. Joey, I'm yes. looking in your background at that at that legendary couch. Yes. Who who is the one person who you think has logged the most naps on that sofa? That would be the idea guy for sure. <laughs> 
about half a 100%. chicken, six ribs, <laughs> some wings, one thirty in the office. He's out. It's he's on the on the couch. No doubt. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a Aaron, bring, bring, bring some life to this conversation. What are the benefits of being the bank? Well, I agree with Joey. This is the sleeper conversation. And when me and Joey were working hard on what can we flesh out in this conversation, the thought occurred to me, maybe I got a little head trash about this. Maybe this is a little sleeper conversation to me. But I'll tell you in conversations with people who are learning about this concept of becoming your own banker, people love to get exposed to the idea of, oh, I can be the bank. I want to be the bank. When they understand what bankers get to do, they want that. They're, it, to me, it sounds a little cheesy, but I think that this really is a sleeper topic. I'm with it. Well, what, Russ, why do you think we're talking about it today? Well, I mean, I think that being the bank, the benefit of that is that you get all all the control, you get all the power, you get access to the money, you get the things that we we wish we had when we were sitting there hat in hand praying that the deal's going to go through, right? If you're if you're trying to get a mortgage right now, what are you hoping on? You're you're hoping the appraisal comes back correctly. You're hoping that the loan to value that they uh, assess to you is is higher than lower, right? Because ultimately you want to put as little money in the deal. So you you want to be able to have the you want to dictate the terms instead of have the terms dictated to you. So I think most of us don't believe that we can be the bank, right? So I think maybe today's conversation will be helpful because we can actually bring light to the fact that there are aspects of the banking world that we can put within our own control. That's my opinion. No doubt. No doubt. But what, why do you think this is a timely discussion for today? Like think about where we're at as economy in the world. Why would we, why was this an important topic today, Ernie? Well, I think, I think there's a lot of nervousness in our world. I mean, we look at, at doing deals in the future. We don't know what the economy is going to look look like do we think that bankers do we think that the bank in general is is concerned about what's going on are they nervous not a chance do we think that they might be feeling opposite a little bit excited about the opportunities that might lay in front for them yeah well, I, I, you you go back to um I mean, I know, Ernie, you don't have kids yet. And and so, you know, maybe Caroline watches this with you. But for Joey and I, with little girls, you know, the the Mary Poppins movie, you you hear them singing the song about the bank. And one of the things that they talk about in that in that song is think about the foreclosures. Right. It's and nice. they're thinking about the foreclosures in a positive way. Right. Like it's a part of the list of the benefits of being the bank like this is one of those benefits that you get not only do you get to build railway stations across the world and all the bridges and all the things he talks about in the song but one of the things is think about the foreclosures think about the opportunity that is before us and if we are giving the track record of what before the last week and a half has been defined as a recession if we are in a recession because we have two straight quarters of GDP decline, then maybe that's going to impact some people who were not prepared, right? And the 100%. bank is there to take advantage or opportunity within those who were not prepared. Well, and you, what you just said there is the key of today's conversation. Those who are prepared, and, and, and it really comes down to being in the best position regardless of any economic condition. If you if you really think about that for a second, banks in general across the way in the time of war and the time of recession and the time of plenty, they're always in the best position. And it's because of the way they run their business. Now, some of them have gotten in over their skis, as Russ likes to say, and they've over leveraged because they're they're basically scumbags and they will go 10 to one on any dollar that they actually have on deposit. And that's ridiculous. Like it, we would be under the 
under the jail if that we actually operated that way. So good for them when they went out of business. But in general, banks run their business in a way that they have put themselves in the best position. And that is what we need to take from this conversation. How can we emulate that, put ourselves in the best position, and then win big? Okay, so there's three, I think, three kind of main categories of benefits. There's tons of benefits of being the bank, but we, we don't have time for that in today's show. So we're going to cover them in three kind of tranches. I believe it's cash or cash flow, number one, collateral, number two, and number three, control. Okay. So as we go through this, let's, let's break that down. And uh, Russ, I'm going to start with you. Hold, hold, hold on really quickly before you jump in there, because I feel like what's the the so what to this? Why is it that you believe we're qualified to speak on this subject matter? I think that's the, if I'm driving down the road, I'm on the treadmill, I'm cutting the grass. Why is it that 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 the G three monkeys are are qualified to talk <laughs> about this subject matter? And I, there's there's a lot of subjects that we talk about where we're pontificating, right? We're we're like giving opinions based upon what we've heard or seen. You know, not all all subject matters can we be experts in. Sure. Do you feel like Ernie, this is a subject matter that you have a decent amount of experience in and can speak into? And if so, why? Totally. I mean, you know, if you want to give us the monkey things, for me, it's monkey see, monkey do. I, I, <laughs> I saw Nelson Nash lay out his banking situation. I saw you guys. Well, I got the help. I got to see behind the curtains helping you guys do your own stuff for so long. What it looks like to become the own bank, become your own banker. And so monkey see, monkey do. I've been building my own family bank, implementing the infinite banking concept so that I could become my own banker and have enjoyed the privileges of stacking cash, taking loans, repaying loans. It's a, it's a process that I am implementing in my family and, and using in my businesses. It's a, it's a, it is a foundational tool in my life. I, there's not one day that goes by where I'm not thinking about this or helping other people to build this in their lives. Gotcha. Totally agree. What, what, what would you say, Russ? Yeah, and no, I, I, I feel like that was great, what you said there. I mean, we have been setting up our own banking system using the kind of manual that Nelson Nash laid out for us, not only in personal mentorship, but through his book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And we, we got to learn what a bank looks like, how one operates from a very high level, of course. Joey got to see the inside, so you got to see what it looks like in the belly of the beast. And we've had plenty of conversations sidebar about some of those things. And, you know, working in the financial industry for as long as I did, we were almost partners with those in the banking world. And That's right. you, you kind of understand what's happening. Not to mention today, I'm sitting at Clean Juice, one of my favorite spots, right? And one of the guys that works out at the gym I'm in comes in there and I'm like, what are you going to do today? He goes, ah, I'll probably go in the office for an hour or two. And then, you know, he had a list of things he's going to do. And I was like, I don't even know if I know what you do. He's like, well, I, I own a, I own several car lots and our car lots are one of those pay here financiers. And, and I'm like, Oh really? And we started talking. I was like, what are, what's the most profitable thing for you? He goes, Oh, the finance company, of course. And I'm like, I know. Right. So, the, the benefit of being the bank is that you get to control a lot of these things, but also we get to see who's the most profitable business in the world. I had Joey as a mentor to me doing some of the first lending things that we did. I'd invest in a lot of stuff, but I'd never really done a lot of lending. And my business partner over here is putting together like 125% loans on cars that we were doing loans to people on. And I'm like, He's putting together the most sophisticated things. You know, of course, you can't charge somebody 125 percent on the surface. But no. when you when, when you build it out on a weekly or, or monthly basis and they're renewable that way, you can. And he did. And I was I was very impressed. And I got to see how being the bank 
is a huge benefit. Not to mention, once you understand the bank as a whole, Joey, I feel like you say, man, I don't know how much I want to own. I just want to control, right? I think that this is what the Rockefeller and the Rothschild family and all those families talked about is that just give me the access to the money, right? Give me the access to the currency, the ability to control it. I don't need anything else. Well, if you're the financier of stuff, you own everything without having to pay for it. Because as soon as someone quits paying for it, what do you get to do? You get to take take ownership of it back. That's right. It's exactly the reason why I was telling my other buddy that I work out with why he should not be taking all his excess money and paying down houses. Oh, because all we're doing by paying down houses and stuff is we're putting the bank in a better position. Like I, right. I literally want to put the bank in a position to where if if I don't make a payment, they're like, "Crap, we're going to give that dude some time because <laughs> he owes us every bit of what that piece of property is worth." Right? That's I, right. I want them to like go after the person with the fifteen year mortgage who's been paying it down faster, kind of guy. That's right. But you you point out something. Why do banks have the business to begin with? It's because they're the ones that have the cash. All of uh, all of Americans and worldwide people engage with banks because the cash resides at the bank. Their access to capital, which Russ, you and I have said this a million times, the number one obstacle to financial freedom is lack of access to capital, right? Why are more people not financially free? Because they don't have access to cash. Who does though? A bank. And so one of Nelson's rules that we have, we have definitely taken this to heart is don't be afraid to capitalize, right? Don't be afraid to capitalize. Put yourself in a position of cash. That is the first lesson, in my opinion, and benefit of being the bank is being the one who has the gold says, I can make the rules. So Ernie, how have you taken that point of having access to cash, whether it's you, your family, those in which you work on, how have you done that? Well, I think I was trained to do it before I ever heard about the internet banking concept. Uh, Think about this. Uh, There's an expression, Joey, finish this sentence for me. It ain't nothing but money in the bank. When I'm a little kid, I get my coins and I go put it in a piggy bank. Bank. When I went to work and I made a paycheck, all that money got deposited in the bank. This is just this is just easy stuff. If if me and Joey play golf, I'm gonna beat him a hundred times out of a hundred, and you can take that to the golf course. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. Oh man. Sorry. That's a bunch of hooey, by the way. I, I got um, I got rain dance stuck in, in my head. I thought you were going with the bank shot. <laughs> bank it in. So I think Russ to answer your question, I think I think we're trained to intrinsically know that money goes in the bank. Unfortunately, it goes into somebody else's bank where they get to enjoy all the other benefits of. In 2016, I got introduced to the idea of I can slowly over time take over this function. Because whenever a transaction happens, money has to flow from one party to another, and there's a cost to make that transaction happen. I want to be in the benefit seat, the owner's box of that transaction fee as much as possible. So that's what we've been taking over. I just read this comment. It was so drawing joy. I wanted to share it. I realized that my time is not really mine. It's my company's. Now I have to stop negotiating my time for money and I need to start working to become financially free. That's exactly how I felt when my daughter Adler asked me on the way to school, dad, can you pick me up from school today? And I had to say, no, baby, I have to go to work. That's where I drew the line. In order for you to be clear on the things you need to do and stop doing and to know who you need to become so that you can stop trading time for money, join us right now at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash passport. Now let's get back to this episode. What what else do you think it applies to, Russ, as far as cash? Like being the benefit of the being the bank is cash or cash flow, I would even say. Well, how what would you say? 
Yeah, I, I think you see that for banks, right? I mean, they become the hub. I, Nelson Nash used to share this example with us all the time. He would say, hey, he, he would pull up a map and, you know, knowing that he knew where the, the local Walmart distribution center was, he'd go to the little county, like Google Maps, and he'd, he'd like narrow it down into this humongous building and say, Russ, you know what that is right there? And the first time I didn't know, I would say the 99 times after that I knew, but I would always say, no, tell me, Nelson, what is that? He'd say, that is a distribution plant for Walmart. He's like, do you know what they do? I was like, um, I have a feeling, but why don't you tell me? And he said, they're the one that supply all the Walmarts within a geographical radius around them. He said, so all the, all the food comes to that distribution center. You see that big, huge line of trucks over there? They send all that food once it's purchased from the local Walmarts to the store. And then do you know where all the money goes for all the food that has been purchased at those stores? Right back into that distribution center. He said, this is the hub. He said, do you have a place like that yourself for all the things in which you do? Because that's what banks do. Banks have centralized the flow of money through their hub, just like those distribution plants have centralized the flow of food. Banks have centralized the flow of money. So be in the way of the money. And as you said, Ernie, a second, a second ago, where's the first place in which our money goes when we're paid? To the bank. To the bank. It used to happen in the form of a check, right? Normally, what would happen is somebody would get paid on a Friday in the form of a check, and they would take that check and either do one of two things, go to the bank to cash it or go to the bank and deposit it. But it was always the first stop, right? That's right. Nothing more brilliant than that, by the way. I mean, if if our business could be the first stop that everybody had to go through with their money before they went and did something else with it, do you think we would be fairly successful? Absolutely. So they, they found a way to be the hub, not only for where the cash resides, but also for where the cash flows through. And I think that that provides opportunity. Joey and I, we we started this podcast five years ago under this very premise that you and I were being the hub for which deal flow was coming through. Were we not? Like people were coming to us and they were telling us about what they were doing with money. They were That's telling right. us about the deals they were getting into. They were talking about the deals that they were needing money to, to get it, you know, to take advantage of. And we're hearing all this flow and we thought, man, how do we help other people who are not in the line of this flow take action? Well, we can need to create a podcast. We start talking about it, right? So then we can get this message out to a larger audience. And I feel like we've been fairly successful doing that over the last five years. But for us, I think being the bank and being the position of cash is being in the flow of the transaction. Well, and, we, and we've said this before, and I'll say it again. When you put yourself in a position of cash, those opportunities will find you. And the second lesson I think that you can learn from banks is they always, when I say always, they always bring the cash flow back into their control, right? They're, and they're constantly strategically setting up whatever loan that they're making to you or to your family member, whoever it is, to get the highest cash flow that they believe that they can get to come back towards them. If you don't take that lesson and learn from them, you're missing a huge opportunity. And also that's where financial freedom comes from. If I can, if I can strategically put myself in a position of being the bank, then I can get the highest level of cash flow to come back towards me that will be passive in nature and cover my expenses. That is, that is a huge key. Now, let's talk about collateral. Why is collateral a benefit of being the bank, Ernie? What have you seen from that standpoint? How many, how many loans have you taken from the bank in your history where there hasn't been a piece of collateral attached to it, attached to the loan? Very few. Just always. And, and what's the purpose of that collateral? Safety. For you or for the bank? <laughs> Not for me, for them. 
if if you sit if you quit sending them the cash flow they'll come come get the assets 100 and that's business business equipment that's vehicles that's anything that they're willing to lend against real estate that they they will take ownership over that and sell it they, they are always looking to secure their position and then are happy to trade those dollars for cash flow at interest and it's the safest it's so safe for them and it's always attached to a piece of collateral russ what would you add well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna challenge your response there a second ago, Joey. Whenever Ernie said, "How many loans have you ever gotten that you didn't have to put up collateral?" and you said very few, and the answer is zero. The answer is absolutely zero. And you're gonna be, but Russ, I've gotten credit cards from people before from the bank, right? You may have even gotten one of those non-collateralized loans. Yep. So how is it that zero loans then were collateralized? And I'm going to tell you that they were all collateralized because they were collateralizing what? They were collateralizing your ability to pay it back. That's right. And I can promise you, how many of those loans would they have given you if you couldn't show proof of income and the proof of the ability to pay it back? Yeah, zero. (laughs) Zero. So they were collateralizing it based upon you trading time for money. And we we say one of the things that our our company's goal is, right, is to help people stop trading time for money. So I would say collateral, whether it be a physical asset, which when we're being in the bank, that's what I'm looking for, right? To be honest, I'm not trying to help someone be a slave to the lender. I'm not looking to collateralize their income. If I'm going to lend you money, the benefit to me is I'm going to (laughs) Make sure that you have some hard asset that if if you fall on hard times, I'm going to say, man, I am so sorry for you. I want to support you. And what I'm going to do by helping support you is take this asset that you have that's probably a liability because you're making payments on it or, or you're having to make payments on it because it's the thing that you're using as collateral. I'm going to take that burden away from you. We're going to reduce your payments because you're no longer going to have to deal with that. I'm going to take that over for you. <laughs> right? Such a I'm nice gonna- guy. I mean, I'm just going to be the friend in that scenario and, and help them out, right? I want to support you and where you are. And I'm going to make sure that I, in that situation, am helping out as many people as possible and making sure that they never get in a bad deal. So the collateral they give me is going to have to be at least 50% better <laughs> than the loan I'm giving them, right? Because I don't want them to ever get in a situation where it wasn't enough and then I have to collateralize their income on top of it, right? Mm. That, to me, that's just not a, a good thing. We have a friend of ours, Mitch Stevens. He's been on the show before. Guy's bought a house every three to four days for the last 20 years. He says, yeah, I, I'd be in the bank for all of these businesses, for all these investors, and, and for all the uh, people buying houses from me on uh, seller financing. He said, but then I take all of that money and I go put it in places that – I have collateral. I'm, I'm going to make sure that I have three ways to get paid. And he starts talking about how he owns all these storage buildings, right, Joe? You remember this? That's right. Yeah. And, and he says, the first way I'm going to get paid, I'm guaranteed to get paid, is that if they want their stuff back, they're going to pay me for it. But if, they're, if there's some reason why they can't pay me for it, right, then... I, the the usually the bank in which they have it financed, whether it's their their personal vehicle, their RV, their boat, one of those companies is going to have to come pay me for it to get it to get it out of storage, right? Because they're going to repo it. They got to come to me. Well, in order to get it back from me, they got to pay me for the rent in which they were using. And if none of the two of those happen, I'm just going to sell it, <laughs> and I'm going to get my money back, right? So he's being a bank in the form of having a storage facility. That's right. And I think about that is that it all comes back to collateral. Who is controlling the asset, the collateral, and is that collateral good? Exactly. And that's why I say that banks have consistently put themselves in the best position to weather any economic storm. And if you're not in that position, learn from this, right? This is part of being this, the benefit of being the bank is, is learning from them as well. And it all leads to the third point of control. If I control the cash, if I 
now can pick what collateral I'm willing to lend against. I am 100% in control of the terms in which I lend it out, right? There are numerous, numerous ways that a bank can control. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. One, they can set the terms on in which you repay them. They also can, and I'm going to point out something very specific here, home equity lines of credit. We've talked about them. They are not your money. They are the bank's money. And you have a line, open line of credit right now. In the next year, they could easily come and say, by the way, you know how that was a $200,000 line of credit? It's not 200000 anymore. It's 50000 Because they also control the the time frame in which you can borrow from them or if they can change the terms at any time. That is 100% control. What other ways would you say that the bank has control that you've seen, maybe Ernie? Well, I just want to zoom in on that just for a second because occasionally I'll people asking, hey, I love the idea of this infinite banking concept. Can I do banking with my home equity? And the answer is, Absolutely. That's awesome. So cool. But what you just pointed out is, is the fundamental problem with banking through that. And I could be honest, I'm nervous. I can't, I can't make anyone do anything. But if, if you're building your foundation of control of cash in equity lines, that is not your money and subject to someone else's rules, that's a very dangerous place to store all your cash. And so this uh, this concept of velocity banking, I'm literally going to take all of my money and put it into this equity line and take draws for my need. Yes, you can do banking that way, but that is very dangerous based upon what you just laid out, Joey, because you think you're in control. You think the banker values your relationship above everyone else's until they don't. And they they call that line, they freeze that line. That's that's a bad day. I mean, Russ, how many times have you heard of businesses shut down because the bank says, "Yeah, things are getting a little hazy here." We have multiple examples of business owners who were running several multi multi million eight eight figure revenue businesses and profitable as much as. A million, million five. I mean, great, great economic scenarios for those who own those businesses. And the bank came in and froze the line of credit in which they were using to to purchase the goods and then sell from, right? And they were just taking the flow and sending it back. Unfortunately, the you know, there's an example. <laughs> we were talking about this the other day, and I was with some friends of mine. And this guy had created this amazing business. He he sold um, aftermarket products for auto, uh, automobiles, and the he built, he and his family built this company from from nothing. And he had always done business with Amstaff Bank, a, you know, a pretty prominent bank in the southeast. And he had uh, like a twenty five million dollar line of credit. He operated his business off this line of credit. And was doing really well. I, I, I mean, if you looked at his life, you'd see his nice house, lake house, nice vehicles, right? All the vacations. And he 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 was telling a friend of mine, he said, you know, I remember the day in which I came home from work and I turned on the news and they said, Regions Bank have just purchased Amsoft Bank. And he said, I looked at her and said, that's going to be an issue. <laughs> Less than 90 days later, they came to him and says, we have assessed your business and don't believe it's worth the amount of money that the line of credit we have against it is. And so we're going to just call your loan. He didn't have $25 million. He couldn't pay off the line of credit. I would, I mean, he, he, he's like, I could sell my business and I, it won. I mean, try to fire sell that kind of business in 90 days. It just, you can't. Right. Right. And so he he's like, I don't know what to do. So we went out and found a buyer and, and the buyer said, here's what we'll do. We'll take over the, the loan. We're not going to pay you anything. <laughs> We're going to take over the loan as long as you keep running the business and we'll just keep, we'll pay you a salary. 
which was obviously a fraction of what the profitability of the business was. So he did it. Less than a year later, the economic environment nosedive. Okay, you know the time frame we're talking about. <laughs> and so then now that business was an enormous company. I was like, oh, we do not want this business anymore. Car car uh, purchases as a whole were going bad, much less all the aftermarket products. He ended up buying the company back for $130,000. $130,000. So he got rid of like a 15, I think he had a, like a $25 million line of credit, but he owed 15 million on it. He bought back the business for $130,000. He sold the company about 15 years later for 300 million. That's the, that's the beauty. But going back to the control part is that he was operating a, an amazing business and had a great deal with the bank in which he was working in. But he wasn't guaranteed that that bank or the bank president or the officer that he's dealing with was going to be there forever. And when that situation changed, the new group who came in decided he was not worthy anymore. So where he thought he was in, he was in great shape. He ultimately wasn't. And his story turns out great, but it could have easily been really bad because all the things he had worked for his whole time up to that point were taken away from him. no doubt I, I was just on a call yesterday with a, a syndicator a guy that's putting together syndications for multifamily and he said you know there's this new niche for middle financing i said what's that he said well there's a capital stack now debt is the first one and you know that's the banking function that's i go to get uh, a loan to buy this multifamily and it's always been 75 to 80 percent purchase they're willing to put on debt he said uh recently that's dropped to 65. well is that that's because of the environment that we're in the bank says uh uh, -uh i don't want to take 80 percent exposure i'm going to drop it to 65. that's another example of control it's another position that we can learn from to be like the bank and to always be in that position. Uh, I won't get into the rest of the conversation because it's not necessarily important for today's topic, but these are the things being in a position of cash, always looking at the collateral and making sure that you're in control. These are the benefits and these are the lessons of being the bank. Um, I'd be Ernie, remiss if I hey, hold on a second. I want to ask Ernie here because I think as we're wrapping this up, Ultimately speaking, we've we've shared some of the the issues that exist when we don't have cash, when we are not in a position where we have collateral, where we've given up that control, right? Ernie, what is the the simple strategy that you walk through every single day with people to be able to put themselves in the benefit of the bank so that they can have those three things? Right. Uh, I give the answer a resource to support that. It is such a privilege to, well, number one, it's a privilege to have known Nelson Nash and to benefit from the concept that he created. It was a benefit to be able to help other people implement that same process. The solution is to begin to put your business, put your family in the way of becoming the bank, right? So we, we need these lines of credit, right? We're right now you may be depending on other banks to do that. We've talked about the challenges of that, the, the lack of control you have, the benefit that they have against your collateral and, and ultimately where the cash goes away from you, never towards you. And so putting yourself in a position where you can begin to build access to capital as your own line of credit, that's the opportunity to become your own banker in your business, in your family, so here's a resource. I think the best simple demonstration of this as a cash flow management tool line of credit is the first chapter of the book, The Case for IBC. And Carlos Laura on the board of the Nelson Nash Institute, this is how he made most of his career working in businesses to help explain the solution as they got themselves in trouble, like you're explaining, Russ. So that first chapter is extremely helpful. It's in video form. 
Uh, if you go to the Nelson National Institute, infinitebanking.org, and get the foundations of infinite banking, certainly within Wealth Without Wall Street and our online community, we talk through all of these things. We have our own courses. We help people set this up. But that is the solution, Russ. I love that. I love that. So, all right, last final thoughts. I'm going to start with you, Russ, and uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll close it out. Well, first, I want to just... Thank you for running this meeting so so well. I know a lot of times I tend to take over, and today oh. you you MC this thing brilliantly. And without Mark Harguchi here, without JD Hill here, I mean you stood up, and I appreciate that. So first takeaway is thank you to the stack. The, the second takeaway I have is if you are thinking about what the shifting market looks like right now. If you're concerned about that, if you're thinking, well, maybe should I be paying off all the debts that I have? So that way, if my income starts to go down, maybe your income has already gone down. Maybe you're in a world where the, the market has has reduced your income 30, 40%. We know people like that. And you're, you're trying to figure out what is the right next step for you. Then I would say, have you taken to heart this concept of becoming your own banker, right? Have you taken the steps needed to understand this so that way, even at a baseline level, you could implement it, right? Not everybody needs to be doing this at the same way that Ernie Brown is doing it, right? Ernie's been around us for a long time and has started implementing this at a really high level. But maybe for you, it's, I, I need to, as one of our friends say, start, a bunny hill policy. I need to start this system, get my get my toes wet. And I, I would say that's a good thing. Now I will I will put one caveat to that is if you do start this system, put enough in to where you can do something with it, right? Because <laughs> if you can, you won't see the benefits of it for long enough that it probably won't make sense. But I definitely I, I want to put that point in there that I think we cannot give up the basic tenets that we can be the bank in the general rule, right? Yes, we can't multiply the money times 10 and, and we, we don't get everybody to give us the money ahead of time. But if you get involved in some of the passive income strategies that you hear on this podcast, what you will find is what one of our passive income mastermind members said to us, initially, there will be way more deals than you have access to money to. But as you keep going through that process, what you will see is that you will ultimately end up with more money than you have access to deals. And so you need to prepare for those things. And having a place for that money is amazing. I just got off the call with a lady out of Colorado who just sold uh, uh, one of her businesses for multiple eight figures. It's a wonderful problem to have. Had she known us earlier... <laughs> She would have known exactly where to put that money because right now she was telling me on the phone about the number of financial advisors that have called her over the last 30 days since that transaction happened because it's public information because it, it was a major company. And she says, I'm getting hounded everywhere and I've got this money sitting at the bank and I just don't know what to do, right? That is a problem. But if, if you would have followed become the Wealth Without Wall Street strategy a long time ago, we would have helped her found have a place for that money to go to immediately so that she would be able to make decisions, not off emotion and the pressure to take action on something, but she would have already known what to do. That's my final thought. Yeah. Uh, earn final thoughts, not final um, <laughs> novel. If you can I was, I was about to say thoughts. the same thing. <laughs> like, man, where do I, where, what do I even say that Russ didn't say? I don't think anything exists. All the words. I, I I agree. There's a there's a there's an encouragement. If you haven't yet started, here's your opportunity. And the best way to do that is to go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com slash free call and get on the phone with someone who is an expert in this, who is authorized as a practitioner of this concept that Nelson Nash created. And then for the for the person who who maybe has a future a future windfall, rest like you're saying, who has that bunny hill policy, but needs more insight of what what can be done. Last month in our inner circle, we had a focus on infrastructure, and we talked all month about infinite banking inside the inner circle, 
And it's been so encouraging. All the examples that we laid out through that month has really been beneficial to our members who, who have started implementing infinite banking and are looking to go to the next level, just need exposure, right? I don't know what I can create until I get a vision for that. And that's the same for why did I want to become my own banker in the first place? Is because I saw how I could be my own banker for my student loans and how that's grown just by being around a community of like-minded people. And so if that's you, you've started but need perspective, the inner circle is built for this. We're about to go into our inner circle, expand this round table. Everybody on this call can interact in the things going on. What a wonderful thing. In fact, I'm pretty sure Nelson Nash told us to do that exact thing in the end of his book. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to do. And that's the opportunity for you. 100%. You guys both took my, uh, my final thoughts and yeah, we'd love to have you. I, I actually talked with a guy this week who already has his system set up, right? Doesn't need any, as far as like knowledge of how to build his policies, but he's like, where do I go from here? How do I become a better investor? And you can't, you cannot sidetrack what it would, what it means to start borrowing that knowledge from a collective mastermind like the inner circle. And that's where we're heading right now. Again, as Ernie mentioned, go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash free call and get access to the inner circle through one of these coaches. We'd love to have you. Thanks as always for joining us on today's episode. If you, if you got value from it, please like it, uh, rate us, review us and share it with somebody who needs to become their own bank as well. We'll catch you on the next episode. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.